we will see you face to face and forever we will worship Jesus you are all to us Jesus you There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is over my name. 
Hear the holy roar of God resound. Hear the holy roar of God resound. <laughs> Come on in and stand up with us as we begin our day of worship. Come on in from the foyer and grab a place. Good to see everybody this morning on a beautiful day. Amen. Here we are. Your life will be I'll sing the right song today. We'll sing that song in a little while. It's still on the mind for the It's fun. I know that. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the dark is shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the fire. Oh, yeah. 
Church today. Amen. Amen. What a what a great uh, what a great start to our day of, of worship, and I'm grateful that we serve a God of greater things. Amen. Uh, if you're a, a guest of ours, we we want to welcome you. If you're joining us online, we want to welcome you. So grateful that uh, you're here today. Uh, if you're a guest, uh, there's a card in the pew rack in front of you. I would invite you to take just a moment and fill out that card. Let us know that you were here with us today. And on the back of that card, there's a place for uh, any person to, to write any prayer requests or concerns that you have going on in your life. We want to, as a staff, partner with you in that. And, and so you can take that card right after uh, service today out into the foyer, and there's a guest services location where you can place that card, and we'd love to get to know you before you leave today. Uh, had a great weekend. Uh, it was our marriage seminar. Had about 35 couples uh, participate uh, this past weekend. And I uh, had a, a visiting couple from uh, Houston, Texas, Jeff and Martha Reese, who uh, blessed us immensely this weekend. And I want to I just welcome them. Jeff and Martha, if you'll stand and just let us welcome you to Homewood this weekend. And so thankful for... Thank you for blessing uh, our marriages uh, this weekend uh, by the things that God spoke through you. Very grateful for that. Uh, well, you'll notice if you've been here for the past few weeks that we are back to being a two-projector church, and we're very grateful for that. And uh, uh, so many folks, one of the things I love about this church, so many folks just, uh, just raise their hand and say, how can I help? And, uh, and that has been the case uh, these past few weeks uh, as we've, uh, something as simple as, as a projector going out. Uh, and I just want to say thanks to the Tech Arts team, uh, the James Rasco, and, and I'm, I'm going to just rattle off a few of these guys, William Cook, uh, James Walton, Mitchell Kilpatrick, Jacob Hall, Jonathan Strasser, Doug Raglan, uh, uh, Gary Davis went and got it Friday, and these guys just did an awesome job uh, behind the scenes, and, and they, don't, they don't do that for recognition, but I want to thank them today, so you give them a round of applause. Thank you for all that they do. And where they, they volunteer to keep us to keep us moving. I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. Uh, well, I told you last week that the month of March, we are starting a, a hospitality challenge. And so uh, what that means is, as a church, if you're a member of this church, you, you've got 31 days uh, to invite somebody from this church into your home that has not been in your home before. And so uh, I told you the way that the enemy is going to attack you and and uh, here's the, the series graphic for a new series I'm starting next week calling Who's Your One? And uh, that's going to have uh, various meanings, and we're going to unpack that for a few weeks. Uh, but I, I want you to, if you've not already been praying about the hospitality challenge, I've, I've heard from several of you emails and text messages about who you're going to have over your house and when you're going to have them over, and that's awesome. And I want you to keep praying about that. I told you how the enemy's going to attack you. One, he's going to tell you you're too busy, uh, so go ahead and expect that. Uh, secondly, he's going to tell you that, that your house is too dirty or your place of dwelling is too dirty. dirty. And, then, and then third, he's going to tell you that, that uh, you know, either the place that you live you're, you're ashamed of or it's too, too small or it's too big or it's not in the right part of town. And so, so just be aware that that's how the enemy is going to be working on us. But as brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, may we rise above that and may we become a people who get to know one another. And that may be the, another way that the enemy attacks you. He's going to tell you that, uh, uh, you know, you don't want to get to know anybody. And, and that, may be, that may be the posture that you take. But I want to encourage you to really step out in faith, uh, have somebody over for the hospitality challenge. A couple of family matters. I want to extend our sympathy this weekend to uh, Lisa Caulfield and the passing of her brother over the weekend. They're out in Texas tending to that right now. Uh, but I want to be in prayer for Lisa and the family, and also Mary Beth Peach, uh, the passing of her uncle uh, over the weekend. Those did not make it in the worship guide, so I want to make you aware of that as a faith family. I just want to say that if you're, if you're looking for a church home, uh, I, I pray that, uh, that you look no further. Uh, I pray that, uh, that home would become your faith family as well, and uh, we're, we're rejoicing. We've had uh, 16 folks since the first of this year that have joined the journey with us here at Homewood and, and placed membership with us and want to be a part of this faith family. We've had four folks baptized into Christ since the first of this year. And we just, we praise God for that. And we say amen. And uh, if you want to join that journey as well, uh, the way you do that is go to one of our Catch the Vision classes, which uh, will take place uh, the first weekend of April. Mark your calendar, April 3rd. And uh, we would love to tell you a little bit about Homewood and give you an opportunity to become a part 
of the family here. As we continue our hearts in worship, I'm going to ask if you'll bow your hearts, bow your heads, and let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we just say good morning. We're so grateful that by your grace that you have brought us into this room today. And God, we, we gather not just with the people in this room, but we, we gather with followers of Jesus all across the globe today because you are a global God. And so we, we lift your name up and we pray today that, that Jesus is the one that is exalted. Got to look across this room and I, I see that, that folks in this room, our, our desire is to point one another to Jesus. And so I know that even the, the tech arts team that we mentioned a few moments ago, their desire is not to be pointed to themselves, but their desire is to do things that, that point us to Jesus, whether that be through technology or what have you. I look at our praise team as they get up on their, the stage. Their job is not to entertain. Their job is to point us to Jesus. And so I pray as we continue to worship that we, we, we go to that place of participation and not just that place of, of observation. God, you have called us here today for a purpose, and that is to lift up your high and your holy name. So, God, I pray today that you just, you just tell us the story of Jesus. Whether we've heard it a thousand times or whether today's the first time, God, I pray that, that you will just indwell this place with your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tell me the story of Jesus right on.
majority of our folks, and uh, we participated in communion with about 12,000 teenagers. It was really amazing. Uh, the theme was walk at Winterfest, and they always use intense visual images for the teens, and they actually had the Walindas, the tightrope walking family there, right in the middle of the conference, doing their thing. It about killed me, because <laughs> I know that's gonna be the one time that they fall. But what the, they interviewed the, the head of the Walindas after the, the performance, and he said, you know, we start <clears throat> with the tightrope six inches off the ground when we start training our family members. Then we move it up to a foot after about a year. Then we move it up to six feet, and over time, it becomes second nature. And so the theme of, uh, of that particular talk was that we train ourselves with our daily walk for the big moments or for the temptations that bring us on. And that's through regular prayer, Bible study, coming to church to meet with fellow Christians, and it's also through communion. And I calculated, I've taken communion 1,872 times in my Christian life. Many of you have taken it a lot more than that. <laughs> but what that's doing and what this does for us is it trains us to make it second nature, focusing on Jesus, focusing on his death and burial and resurrection so that it's, it's innate in us, it's ingrained in us. If we don't have communion with this amazing gift that Jesus gave us, we really miss something. And I think we've probably seen that over the years when you do miss. Um, and so please try to think about that, um, that this is not a mundane weekly thing that we do. This is actually something that is training us almost subconsciously that, uh, for, to, to prepare us for whatever's coming. And it's an amazing gift that Jesus gave us. So I'm glad that we do it every week. So let's bow. Dear Father, thank you so much for the gift of your son. Uh, we thank you for uh, the sacrifice that he made, his death on the cross. We remember his body uh, as it lay there. And uh, we pray that uh, you'll help us to, uh, to focus on, on that today and every day as you train us to be better equipped to be Christians. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's bow. Father, we remember um, your son at this time. We remember the blood that was shed. We take this cup in that remembrance as you did so many years ago with your disciples. Um, give us peace, give us focus, 
help to block out the things that don't need to be in our minds to, uh, to remember you and remember that sacrifice. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Us. Where I first saw the light and the burn that we also give at this time and it's a discipline that we have if you think about uh, all that we've given over the years it's amazing doesn't make sense to the world I had a patient a few weeks ago whose husband wanted to have her committed because she was giving 10% of their income to the church so um, think about um, this gift as well because it absolutely is a gift that we have a chance to to give so please bow with me dear God thank you so much for the chance that you've given us um, to give back to you it can never be enough. Uh, it can never, ever equal what you've done for us. But help us to know that it's not the amount, it's the, the discipline and the training uh, that we give every week. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All our kids are dismissed at this time to class. If you'll head out from uh, ages four to second grade, straight up through the middle aisle there, and there'll be teachers out there in the foyer to take you to Kids Church. We're going to sing uh, two more songs before Brett speaks to us today. People need the Lord. People need the Lord.
Amen. And uh, Dr. Stair, I, I, that's pretty amazing. A patient wanted their spouse committed for giving too much to the church. And uh, I pray that the world will want us committed for worshiping God uh, every week. Just uh, what an amazing opportunity we have uh, to, to come and, and gather in this room and do what we get to do today. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to be opening to Acts chapter 8. Uh, we'll be there in just a moment. Uh, we've been in a series entitled Unleashed, uh, where we've been talking about just uh, what, what does it, it, it look like to live a life following Jesus. And we go back to the, to the early church through the book of Acts, and we see that they, they, they lived anything but leashed lives. And a lot of times we, we think that uh, uh, the life of, of Christianity is a leashed life. You know, maybe we're leashed to these rules or, or we're leashed to these, these things that we're, we have to do and and we go back and we investigate their early church and we see that that's, that's not really how they lived. Uh, it was, it was a, a yielding to God's spirit. And, and by yielding to God's spirit, there was, there was this unleashing that took place through the power of his spirit. And so um, last week we looked at seven men uh, who, were, who were given this, this opportunity to, to unleash ministry in Acts chapter 6. And, uh, and one, of those, one of those men was, was Stephen. And, uh, and so we're, we're going we're gonna to look at, at, at Stephen for just a moment, and then we're, we're going to bounce over to, to Acts chapter 8. Um, but I, I want to remind you what the criteria was for these individuals to be unleashed to do ministry. Do you remember what the criteria was? They had to be full of the Holy Spirit, and they had to be full of wisdom. wisdom. I believe that we are full of wisdom when we become full of God's spirit inside of us because if any of us lacks wisdom, James says, we need to, we need to ask God for it because he's, he's the one that gives wisdom, amen? And so, and so I was just looking back as, as we were reading uh, last week in Acts chapter 6 and, and, and look what happens to Stephen right after he's appointed to do ministry. 
Now, I, I want you to just imagine that you're, you're given a ministry, and then, and then like the next, next day, th- this, this breaks out. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. It's not on the screen, but if you want to follow along and flip back in your Bibles a couple pages, you can read with me. Now, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, how would you like to be described as, as that? Just, just insert your name and then full of God's grace and power. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be pretty cool? I, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind having that description in my life. Perform great wonders and signs among the people. Verse 9, opposition arose. How many, how many of us know that, that, that opposition is going to arise in our lives? I want you to imagine if you were on your way, maybe on your way to, a, to, the, to the lake or something later today, and, and you, get to a, you get to a place on your way, and, and all of a sudden your car stalls, and you've got to pull over to the side of the road, and you're in an area where there's, there's no cell phone coverage. So you pull out your cell phone to call for help, but no signal. But you see a hill about, about 100 yards away, and it's gotten dark by now. And you say, you know, if I can just walk to that hill about 100 yards away, then I, I'm, pretty sure I could get, I'm pretty sure I could get coverage on my cell phone. So you start walking. And I just want you to imagine this with me. And you, get about, you get about halfway in between your car and, and the hill where you're going, and you hear this, oh. And that's, that's not, a, that's not an, an, an owl, it's, it's a wolf. And the next thing you know, you are surrounded by a pack of wolves. What do you do? I mean, w- w- I mean you're surrounded by a pack of wolves. Now, now w- what do you do? Some of you are thinking run and, and you're dead. And this is kind of, and this is kind of, if that doesn't make you nervous, uh, just thinking about it. I mean, it makes me, it makes me a little bit nervous. But, but you just think about, this is, this is kind of the context in which Stephen finds himself. That all of a sudden he's surrounded by a pack of wolves. And, 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 and Scripture lists all these different groups that surround him and, and begin questioning him. But verse 10, but they could not stand up against the wisdom of, the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Verse 11, then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Skip down to verse 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. And isn't it curious that that, that the, the very person that they are accusing Stephen of defiling, this, that they're, they're accusing him of, of going against the customs of Moses. And then one of the very next verses says that Stephen's face, they looked upon Stephen's face and it looked like the face of a what? An angel. His face was, was glowing. It was, it was radiating. Which is, is very curious to me because who's the other person in Scripture that we read of coming off a mountain and having a radiating and glowing face? Moses. And so in Acts chapter 7, verse 1, then the high priest asked Stephen, are these charges true? And then Stephen preaches his first and last sermon. I mean, he, he's got one shot. This is his first and his last one. And he does so by telling a story. The story of the Old Testament, which is the story of Jesus as the climax and the story of Jesus as the foundation of all that will be. Do we have any bowlers in the, in the, in the crowd today? Anybody like to bowl? I like to bowl, so I'm going to talk about it. And so if you bowl, you know you have, you have kind of this, this thing that you have to do. You know, you have a run-up, right? So you, you get set, and you have to kind of run so many steps, and then, and then you let the ball go. And this, this is what Stephen, led by the Holy Spirit, decides to do, is, is basically give a run-up. And it's not just a run-up to, to anybody or anything, but he, he gets set up, and he... He begins by, by talking about 
Abraham and, and Isaac and, and Jacob and and then he talks about Joseph, and, and then he talks about the prophets, and he talks about how, how, how Solomon kind of built this house to, to house God, but God cannot be, be housed in just, just a house. And so he begins to, he begins to give the run-up, and he gives the run-up to who? He gives the run-up to Jesus. That, that's how he tells the story. That it becomes, becomes about the one and, and the only, Jesus Christ. And scholar N.T. Wright says that the one of the great arts of Christian theology is to know how to tell the story. That a lot of times, and I, I found myself you know, getting trapped by this sometimes too. Some, a lot of times we can, we can even go back to the Old Testament and we can tell these, these good stories, but, but we just... We just leave them there, like that. That's all. That that's all. Like uh, that's all that ever happened. But what we begin to realize as we as we read the context of Scripture is that that it's leading to someone. It's leading to a climax. It's it's leading to 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 the one that we call Jesus. And, and so Stephen gives this run up. And then look with me. This is the same story that that got Stephen. Killed, And so at the, at the close of Acts 7, verse 59, while they were stoning him, anybody been stoned this week? Doesn't feel great. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Sounds like who? Sounds like Jesus, the one in whom he's talking about. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And scripture says that, that those that were witnessing this, they took their coats and they, they laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. And we're going to talk about Saul in just a, a couple weeks. But it, isn't, it, isn't it interesting as, as we look at this and we look at the, we look at the, the start of, of the book of Acts and we see that, that there is this mission that is being unleashed. And so if you, if you want a, a title for today's message, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to unpack unleashed mission. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that we talk about a lot in this church. You, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you're going to be my witnesses in, in, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And up until this point... The mission has been local. The mission has been right there in the Jerusalem area. But, but this event with Stephen is going to be a bridge to unleashing mission to be a global movement the way that God intended it to be. And so until we get to today's passage in chapter 8, the far off we're still left out. But look what chapter 8 verse 1 says on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria and today we get to see I want you just to imagine the, the video camera honing in on on one guy you know God yes God God loves numbers you know but but God loves you he loves faces. He, he loves individuals. He, he, he loves groups, yes, and we've read about, read about thousands in the book of Acts who have already been saved, and, and now the camera comes in and hones in on one guy. And another guy that we read about last week whose name was Philip. And so read with me in Acts chapter 8, verse 26. This will be our primary text for the day. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the, the desert road, that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki, which means queen of the Ethiopians. Now I just want you to get a, stop for a moment and get a picture of this guy. I mean, this guy works with and for the queen 
He had to give up some things. We'll talk about that another time. But, but he, works for the, he works for the queen, and he is loaded. He's loaded. I mean, he's rolling in his SUV with rims right now. And he, he's gone to Jerusalem to worship. And this is not, this is not just your run-of-the-mill dude. I mean, this is, this is some, some guy that, that's got a lot going on. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, verse 28. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And then the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And then get this, verse 30. Then Philip ran up to the chariot. Now, how many, how many of you just love that verse? I mean, I love that verse. I love that, that Philip was told by the Spirit to do something, and he runs up to the chariot. Now, how many of us, when, when the Lord tells us to do something, we just start groaning? Uh, go help this person. Oh, I don't have time to help this person. Go, go in and speak a word on my behalf over here. Oh, I got, I got work and I got kids. I got a... We just start groaning. What an act of obedience that Philip was told by the Lord to do something and he ran and he did it. And he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. He said, do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage, verse 32 of Scripture, that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And I love this story because it, it reminds us that we are all, at one point in life, searchers. That we're all searchers. And you're going to come in contact with people this week who are searching. They may not be wrestling with a particular verse in the Bible. Maybe they are. But, but they are, they're searching. They're searching for purpose in life. They're searching for hope. I encounter people every week, and you, and you, just, you just see there's, a, there's an absence of hope in their life. And it's, it's, it's almost crippling sometimes. Just to, just to see that all around us. And you're going you're gonna to encounter people this week that are searching. And, and it's almost like Philip is just teed up right here. I mean, this is, this is a verse in Isaiah that it just paints a perfect picture of the Lord Jesus. I mean, imagine you going into Starbucks this afternoon. And you go in to grab your cup of coffee for $72.05. And you see, somebody, you see somebody sitting there, and, and they got their Bible open to John chapter 3, verse 16. And they read it out. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And they look at you and say, what does that mean? I mean, would you like to be teed up to, to that? I mean, there's a lot of verses in the Bible that I don't want. I mean, I'm a preacher. I don't want people to ask me what that means because I don't know what it means. But you ask me about John 3.16, I'm going to be talking to you. I'm happy to talk to you about John 3.16. And, and Philip is just, is just teed up here to put in a word for Jesus. And so I want us to notice something about the Ethiopian. I really, I really think this is, is vital for us to get. He had gone to the right place in the day. He had gone to Jerusalem. He had, he had been told about the right and one true God, Yahweh. And he had the right book. He was reading the right text. And yet he was still confused. And it wasn't a matter of his intellect. It wasn't a matter of his desire. It, it wasn't a matter of his socioeconomic status. But you see, in Jerusalem, 
he had gotten a copy of the written word. But he had not yet met the living word. He didn't have the lens of Jesus through which he could read and understand the very word of God that he was holding. And I think, church, this is very important for us to pursue for just a moment. Now, you know that I love the Bible. I'm in my happy place when I'm able to hold this book in my hand and tell people what it says. I believe this is what God has, has called me to do. And he had a funny way of getting me to it, but, but I'm thankful that he called me to do it. But here's the reality. The Ethiopian had the Bible. And I realize he didn't have the, the New Testament scriptures, but he had the Bible, but he didn't have Jesus. And so look at me, look with me at, at verse 34. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And, and so you have a searcher, and you have him wrestling with Scripture, and he needs to meet a speaker. And so if you're, if you're jotting down notes this morning in your worship guide and those lines, those blanks for you, I, I want you to just jot this down this morning. That for anyone to meet the one and only Someone must get in the chariot. And my friends, too many Christians today, I believe, and I, I don't say this to, to make you feel guilty, but too many Christians today are like the Arctic River. They're frozen at the mouth. And church, I know it matters how we live. I know that actions can speak, and I know if, and I know that, that folks can, can read the Bible and come to faith without having anybody around them. But, but this story that we are reading today denies the popular idea today that faith comes by watching. That if we just live lives of integrity and do good things, that folks will somehow come to Jesus. And yes, God can use all that, but I'm here today to submit to us that, that that's not altogether biblical. That faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. And so he had the desire, he had the book, but someone had to get into the chariot and speak for Jesus. And so Paul says in Romans 10, verse 14, but how can they, they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And church, I believe that every one of us in this room can tell somebody how we met Jesus. I believe every one of us can tell somebody how Jesus has, has changed our lives and what he has done for us. And so you have a searcher wrestling with the scripture, connecting in a God-ordained moment with a speaker, but we need one more thing. Look with me in verse 35. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture, and he told him the good news about Jesus. Now, I love that verse, church, because if you and I are not bringing up Jesus, we are not bringing good news. And so you have a searcher who meets a speaker who points him to a Savior. And as I prayed earlier this morning, that that becomes the, the mission, the unleashed mission of the church. You can't really understand this book until you know who the star of the story is. Amen? 
And that was the eunuch's problem. He had been given the written word, but he had not yet met the living word. And Jesus said in Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And the reason we speak is to not get to people to agree about a doctrine. We speak to get people to surrender to a person. And when folks surrender to a person, then they'll do anything he asks. Amen? And so we have to know, we have to know our role. Hello? Get someone to embrace the one and only, and they'll embrace everything he asks. And that's what happens. Look at verse 36. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Verse 39, when they they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but, but went on his way rejoicing. Now, church, I don't know where the Spirit took Philip, but I know he took him full of joy. Because there is hardly anything that is more pure joy than being the one that introduces someone to the one. Uh, Just a few weeks ago, uh, our student minister, Justin, and I got to go and and hear a gentleman by the name of Hank Irwin speak. Uh, Hank Irwin uh, was a part of the the movie that came out a few months ago, uh, Woodlawn. Uh, his character was played by uh, Sean Astin, uh, and uh, who's known to most of us as Rudy, but but his character was played by that individual, and and he he tells about the story. This is the 1973 uh, Woodlawn football team, and uh, and Hank said, you know, that the, the the team just didn't didn't really have much promise at all, and so he became the chaplain of the team. And his two sons, Hank's two sons, John and Andrew Irwin, actually produced this movie. Uh, But Hank said he he went to the team and and he just said, you know, he didn't really say this, but he thought they have no chance of having a good season, so why don't we just play for Jesus? And so that's what they did. And and they all all committed pretty much to a T to do that. And, And Hank told us a story that was not in the movie. He said this didn't make the cut, but... But he said it's, it's one of the most powerful, pivotal moments that I believe occurred in that season for these players. He said they had just gotten beaten pretty badly by Banks High School here in town. And he said they got on the bus, and the bus was, was dead silent. He said you couldn't hear a, a pin drop. It was just a very cold feeling. And Hank, the chaplain, got on and sat next to the coach. And as he sat down, uh, the coach waited a few seconds and then leaned over to him and said, you sold them all this Jesus stuff, and now their hearts are broken. You need to get up and say something to these boys. And so Hank sat there in his seat on the bus and said a short prayer, and then he got up and he he looked at all the boys that were sitting on the bus, and he he said, gentlemen, I, I need to tell you something about following Jesus that I have not told you yet. He said that when you follow Jesus, you need to know that there's going to be a test. And the test is going to come to see if you're really all in or not. He said following Jesus is not just a part-time gig. He said following Jesus is not just a genie in the bottle that, that pops up to help you win football games. He says following Jesus is an all in deal. And he looked at the boys and he said, are you all in? And Hank said what what felt like the longest 15 or 20 seconds of his life, it was dead silent on the bus. And then after 20 seconds, a young man in the very back of the bus stood up. And Hank said, I don't even remember which player it was. And he raised his hand and he said, I'm all in. A couple seconds later, another player stood up said, I'm all in too. And then what happened next was a chant broke out on the bus. All in, all in, all in, all in, all in. And the 
the bus started rocking because Jesus had come a-knocking. And here's what happened in the movie with that coach who was sitting in that seat. I want us to take a moment as we close and watch this clip. I wanted to come here today because uh, five of my players are here. <clears throat> five of my players that have been mistreated time and again by their school and by their teammates. And I have not done enough to stop it. Now, at the beginning of this season, um, my team, almost my entire team, they gave themselves to love. I love that I didn't understand. I love that began to conquer hatred. And after the game on Friday, I went home and I prayed. Not that I really know how to do that. But I told God that I don't know if you're real. But I want, I want whatever my players have. And I came here today because I believe. I believe and I want to be baptized. folks to get in the chariot. Jesus had one prayer request in all of scripture. Yeah, he, he taught his disciples how to pray and, and he prayed many times, but, but Jesus had one prayer request. It's in Luke chapter 10, verse 2. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Here's the request. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. I'm going to ask you to, in a moment after we pray and as we sing, I'm going to ask you to take out your phones, and I want you to put this verse in it at 10.02, set an alarm at 10.02 a.m. or 10.02 p.m., whether you're a morning or night person. And I want us for this week to pray this verse every single day. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful for your mercy. We're grateful for your grace. We're grateful that in your providence you have seen fit to share with us the message of your good news today. God, we pray that as the Lord of the harvest, you will send out workers into your harvest field. Father, help us to realize that the church can't be a part of a movement if it's not willing to move. 
And so, God, help us to move. God, we thank you for Jesus. And we thank you that even in the midst of the, the waves of life, that we can still see him beckoning and calling to us. So help us to be a people this week that get into the chariot. It's in Jesus I pray. Amen. As we sing this song, there'll be a shepherd down front. If you have any prayer requests, there'll be a shepherd back here in this chapel if you'd like to make your way back there. If today's the day you want to give your life to Jesus and be baptized in him, we'd love to celebrate that with you. Come as we stand and sing this song. You call me out the plan to be back next week bring somebody with you and uh, a few minutes we're going to be dismissed our Sunday school classes and then tonight in your uh, connect groups so just a great day of fellowship and being together so we're going to close with one more song and then we're going to have a prayer cries for the world we see the world to
God, thank you for this day. Thank you for blessing us with your presence. Thank you for blessing us with this opportunity to come and stand in this room and sing songs of praise to you. Listen to Brett speak your word to us and to speak to you with our hearts, God. Bless us as we leave here that we will carry the message of mission with us, that we'll look for opportunities to serve you every way we go. And it's in your son's holy name we pray and we all say amen. Have a blessed week, folks.